Amen. Well, this morning we're going to share uh, part two of a message that we began last week. And we were looking at Matthew 25 and the midnight cry. We were looking at the parable of the ten virgins. And so we want to uh, look back at that uh, uh, this morning. But I don't want to spend a lot of time in review for, uh, you know, sake of time. And I do encourage you, if you miss on a Sunday, if you miss a lot of times, it's hard to keep up. And so we're just going to pray that you would, um, you would try to watch on YouTube, go to our YouTube station or go to Facebook. You can catch the message. And so I do want to, however, just share a few points so that we can uh, continue this morning. Amen. So let's look, without further ado... <laughs> To Matthew chapter 25, let's review this amazing parable that Jesus shared. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered. And slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there shall, should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and go buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you don't know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amen. And if you recall... Uh, the portion right before this, Jesus is exhorting his disciples, and he's saying, guys, watch, pray, be sober, be diligent. And so then he flows out of that exhortation with this parable. Now, this is a parable of the ten virgins, okay? And it's really a strong word of admonition to our day. And God's speaking to the church to arise, to wake up, amen, uh, to be diligent, to understand the, the, the hour that we live in. It's a serious time. And so what we shared about last week, which is a key here, it's very important, and that is there's really two comings of the Lord. There's many comings of the Lord. The Greek word is parousia, which just means his appearing. But right before the Lord returns in all his glory and splendor, amen, when he returns with the clouds and the sound of the archangel, all that good stuff, there's a coming. He's going to come in the midst of his church. He's coming in the midst of his warrior bride, you might say, for the great final conflict, the war of wars, the conflict of conflicts. There's going to be a clash of the kingdoms, and those that have been prepared have extra oil in their lamp and part of that great army. He's going to orchestrate from his throne this great, great, powerful move of God. And the church is going to arise with such power and anointing and authority. We're going to kick down the gates of hell. We're going to see a harvest like the world has never seen. We're going to see the defeat of our enemies. It's going to be glorious. And then, and we shared about this last week, and then... Mm -hmm. When every enemy has been made a footstool, the Lord's going to come in all his glory and splendor. Hallelujah. Those that are dead or rise and those that are alive with him and remain will be caught up with him and come and rule and reign with him forever and ever. And he sits up, sets up his eternal kingdom. And there's a great judgment throne. Amen. Amen. And everyone will stand before that throne. And I'm feeling led since we're on a run here. I'm feeling led that in the next uh, few weeks we're going to share about that judgment seat. Okay, is that all right? It's good. And so we're going to look at this, and it's going to encourage us, stir us a little. <laughs> but the wake-up call, the midnight cry, is to awaken God's people. It's to awaken us. Again, the indictment was all ten were asleep. Five were foolish because they didn't prepare Five were wise, they had extra oil, but they were still asleep. 
And that's why there was a third group. Remember, there's three groups in this parable. There's the messengers. Those are the watchmen. Those are the ones that are alert. They're the ones that are hearing the message, and they're going forth, and they're stirring the church. Come on, get ready. Rink up. Hello, watchmen. And then there's the five wise what made them wise? They had extra oil in their lamp. They were baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, man. They were after God. They just happened to fall asleep. But the five foolish did not prepare it properly, and they didn't have enough oil. They didn't have enough of the content of God. What does it mean to be a foolish virgin? Basically, you are not a good steward with the anointing and the oil and the presence of God that he gave you. You did not press in. You did not pray, seek, fast. You didn't make, you weren't serious about your life in God. And because of that, you didn't have enough oil. You didn't have enough oil in your vessel, presence, anointing, a capacity for him. And then when the dark times come, you don't have enough lamp. You don't have enough oil in your lamp. Come on, to be part of what God is doing. Scary thing, quite frankly. Amen. And so, uh, very important. So we, we looked last week at the foolish virgins, and, and the Bible says the door was shut to them. These aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. And the foolish virgins, the door was shut, and they could not enter into the banquet, the feast, the great final battle, all the blessings, come on, of the, uh, 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 of the fulfillment of this age and all that God wants to do. Man, that, that, that stirs me. Remember, all ten are saved. Virgins in the Bible are symbolic of believers, separated under Jesus, right? They're saved, but they just don't experience the fullness of the reward that God wants to give, right? How I many know he wants all of us? God, our Father, he wants all of us to enter into the fullness of everything that he's provided for us and everything he's called us to be, but it's on us, really, how much we want him how much oil we want in our lamp, right? And so last week we talked about how important it is, one aspect of that is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's how you get extra oil. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is our earnest. It is our down payment of all that God has prepared for us for now and all of eternity. That's not something to question, debate, to resist. Right? That's something to openly rejoice and receive. Say, Lord, I want all you have for me. How many of you here can say, I want everything. I want all you have for me. Lord, fill this vessel with oil. Fill me to overflowing with your spirit and your presence. Why would we ever debate that or draw away from that? I don't know about you, but I, I'm not going to make it without God. I'm not going to make it with just a little bit of oil. A little dab will do you, right? <laughs> I need a little bit. More than a little bit. I need a whole lot more. I need all, all. And by the way, you can have all you want. Boy, that's good news. So the second group of the wise virgins, they're filled with oil. They've got extra oil in their lamp. They're ready for the coming of the Lord when he does come, amen, and it's time to go forward. He's ready, but they fell asleep. And you have to hear this. I... I He's speaking to our age. He's speaking to us today. In other words, it's very possible to be filled with the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues, worship God, shout, prophesy, do all kinds of great things, just be filled with his presence, be a living witness. That's great. That's what wise virgins are like. However, we can still fall asleep. Just living in this world, the cares of the world, right? Come on. Think about the cares of the world. Think about the troubles, the, tr the, tr the tribulations, the adversities. Think about the pressures. There's a real devil who we don't like to give credit to, but he's real. And there's all kinds of things trying to lull us asleep, trying to discourage us. That's the word, I guess, to discourage us. And what happens is we slumber and we fall asleep to the urgency of the day. That's it. We fall asleep and we slumber. Although we love God, we go to church, we pray, we get all. We're, we're, we're slumbering to the critical day, the urgency of the hour, hearing what God's saying now. And we can just find ourselves kind of in limbo and going, well, you know, <laughs> Sunday, time to go to church and uh, Monday, time to go to work. And, you know, God stir us. Now, 
I want to look briefly at what the scripture teaches us concerning what godly wisdom is. Last week, we looked at the fool. Wasn't that exciting? <laughs> we looked at what it meant to be a foolish virgin. And if you're like me, I said, ouch, a few times. We're all a work in progress, amen? Turn to someone and say, be patient with me. God's not done with me yet. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So last week we looked at foolish virgins, and this morning we're going to look at what it means to be a wise virgin. Now, if you look at the book of Proverbs, okay, the Lord is with us. If you look at the book of Proverbs, we see it is the book of wisdom. What an amazing book, right? It was written by the wisest man that ever lived, who was Solomon, King Solomon. As a matter of fact, uh, remember, uh, there's an account in the scripture where God said, well, Solomon, I'm going to grant you uh, any desire you want, pray a prayer, I'm going to grant that prayer. And Solomon says, here's my prayer, Lord. I pray that you give me wisdom to properly lead and govern my people. And that so impressed God. He said, I'm going to bless you with everything you ever would dream of, but that's the prayer. He prayed for wisdom. Here's the key. Wisdom is a person. Wisdom is a person. The Bible says that in the beginning of all things, that wisdom was the counselor of God. Isn't that heavy? Wisdom was the counselor of God. When God created the heavens and the earth, and God laid out the foundations of all things, when God put together his plan for man, wisdom was his counselor. Can you imagine giving counsel to God like we just shared? That's because wisdom... Wisdom is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the personification of all wisdom. Amen. That's why it says in Colossians, it says that all things are in him, from him, contained in him, flow from him. The Bible says, get wisdom. It's the principal thing. <laughs> Jesus is wisdom. He's the principal thing. He's everything. He's all that we ever should desire or want or need. Wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs, listen to Jesus speaking. It's wisdom. Hallelujah. Oh, I love that. So, we shared in, in, in the English and Hebrew definition of a fool. So this morning, let's share the definition uh, of wisdom. Wisdom is God's appeal to man's reason and conscience to receive his word, instruction, and correction. Wisdom is the content and expression of a man's character, his true inner self that confirms who God is. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge and truth, the receiving of correction and reproof, having true insight and discernment, the ability to make effective plans, right? Proverbs says this, that wisdom builds her house with seven pillars. What house? This house, my life, my family, right? my business, the church, the nation. A nation that is blessed, a person that's blessed, a family that's blessed, builds upon a foundation called wisdom. What did Jesus say? Who's a wise man? He builds his house upon the rock. A wise man will build his house a certain way, and he's going to build it on wisdom, and a key point of all this is most of the time we don't get wisdom until we <clears throat> go through some stuff. Human nature, right? It's a result of correction, discipline. Wisdom is an antonym of foolishness. They're direct opposites. Now, the English definition, the quality of having knowledge, experience, good judgment, and how to apply it in everyday situations. What does James tell us? What a great prayer. James says, listen, church. He says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him come to God and let him ask of the Lord who gives to all men generously, liberally. Isn't that exciting? Whatever you need to know, whatever situation you're in, the Lord has your wisdom. He has the wisdom that you need, but just go believing. He says, but let them come in faith. You know, unwavering, right? Wow, that's powerful. Think about Jesus. Think about the Gospels and think about Jesus' different intera interactions with different people. He expressed wisdom. 
uh, just an, an amazing wisdom. He says to the lady that was caught, you know, in adultery, he's writing on the ground, and then he turns to his, her, her, her accusers and all this. He says, I tell you what, he's that without sin, let him cast the first stone. Boy, he threw cold water on that situation. <laughs> right? And then he turns to the lady and says, your sins are forgiven. Ah, but go and sin no more. Right? Look at all the times we see where Jesus, dealt. he says, what's harder to say your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk? And he left the Pharisees and religious people dumbfounded, speechless, because of his wisdom. Remember when Stephen stood before the crowd and the mob, and the Bible says he began to preach, and his face glowed with the glory of God? The Bible says that he spoke words of irresistible wisdom. It got him stoned, but <laughs> he saw the glory of God. Come on now. The highest praise that can be given to a woman, Proverbs 31, is that she speaks words of wisdom to her family. Wow. The Bible says, Paul said, that Christ in you is the wisdom of God. I think wisdom is pretty important. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now let's look at Proverbs 1, 20. Are we all good? Okay, look at Proverbs 1. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the cheap concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Same word as foolishness. For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Why? What will I do? Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. How many of you want God to pour out his spirit upon our city? Speak words of wisdom to us. Mm, that we've got to hear a cry. We've got to hear the voice of wisdom. <laughs> it's speaking loudly, emphatically. Remember, this is the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, and this is the first place wisdom, the main character, is introduced. So where is wisdom crying? In the gates, in the chief concourse, in the streets of the city. What city? Salem, Boston, New York. Tokyo, Rome, any and every city. Wisdom's crying out to the city, to the church, to the nations, to every leader. Wisdom is crying out. My God. Something to see here. It's not just the city of this natural, physical place, Boston, Salem. Is the church not a city? Jesus said the church is a city set on a hill. We are the city. And Jesus is standing at the gates of our city. And wisdom is lifting its voice and saying, who will hear me? Wow. Gates are in a city. A city has gates. It's the entry point. It's the place where the elders are supposed to sit with wisdom and roll and reign. Jesus is at the very entrance, the gate of our city, and he's lifting his voice. He's lifting his voice. He is outside, oftentimes, all of our religious programs and all of our structures and all of our conventions and all of our good plans and all the stuff that we may do. He's standing there at the gate of the city saying, Hello, if you hear my voice, I'll come in. I'll pour my spirit out upon you and I'll give you my word. I'm already getting a little hmm, stirred up here this morning. Think about that. Lord Jesus, we desperately need... I think about the Laodicean church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and be with them. He's speaking to the Laodicean church. He's speaking to the church of our day. He's speaking to his church. He's at the gate. He's at the entryway at the street and saying, Hello, can you hear my voice? 
I've got the answer. I've got the plan. I've got what you need. How long will you like simple things? How long will you be a fool? How long will you be a scoffer? Huh. That's, that's strong. The greatest need we have in the church today is wisdom. We need the word of the Lord. We desperately need God to speak. Because if we don't receive him, we will sit in the seat of the scorner, the foolish. It's the same word. The simple, the scorner, the scoffer, the foolish are all the same. I don't want to be caught or I don't want to be one that constantly year after year after year is just doing stuff but only doing foolish things or things that may seem right in my own mind. We desperately need to hear the voice of God and we desperately need a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. We can do all our activities or we can stop and have a cry in our heart. I hear, I hear wisdom crying. I hear wisdom crying. Now, let's take a step further, like up close and personal. <laughs> Who are the living gates? We are the gates of God. Lift up your heads, all ye gates, be lifted up, ye everlasting, and the King of glory shall come in. You and I are living gates. God wants to dwell in this city, right? <laughs> so we need to open the gate and let him come in. We need to open our eye gate and our ear gate, right? That's why the Bible tells us, guard your eye gate, guard your ear gate. For whatever you allow into your city, you're going to become. Let's bring it right down where we live. Oh, Lord, help me to guard what I see and allow into my city. Help me to guard what I hear and allow into my city. Because that was what I will become. If foolishness abounds in the heart of man, then so can wisdom. We have a choice. We have a choice of who and what we allow through these gates. Now, <clears throat> some characteristics of a wise virgin or, two, or true spirit-filled believers, they hold quickly to the instruction of God, their natural fathers and to spiritual instructors and counselors. They're quick to listen and slow to speak, right? Did your mama ever tell you, why don't you collect your thoughts before you speak? I don't know if my mom would say that to me. <laughs> I told you about Pastor Ros uh, Oscar Rodriguez, the guy that looks like Mont Ricardo Mont Montalbán. <clears throat> Beautiful man of God wise man of God. He was known as a man of wisdom. He was the man that was really instrumental in helping, you know, restore me back to the church after that crazy stuff I've testified to you about in Baltimore. But uh, one day someone said to him, Pastor Rodriguez, how did you get so wise? How are you such a wise man? And he said, well, it's really kind of simple. I'm just slow to speak. And it's quick to listen. So when I'm in a meeting, I let everybody else talk. And then when everyone's finished talking, I just say something that's just so what I think is kind of common and plain. I'm just saying what I heard. And everyone goes, oh, my God, he's right. Now, there's a man of wisdom. What's the point? We need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Amen? One who lives a life of accountability to spiritual leadership and other believers. One who's... One who uh, submits to the word of God, listens to the Holy Spirit. One who uh, places and values character above gifts in ministry. One who values and seeks their uh, eternal inheritance. Good stewards of God, giving gifts and their call and their ministry in the house of God. Never privy or part of a conversation that is negative about another individual. Hmm. Now, let's go back to our parable. And you can buckle your seatbelt. The midnight cry is being sounded by God's messengers. It's being sounded throughout the earth. The midnight cry, it's getting dark. It's getting dark. It's getting dark. Church, get ready. You better have enough oil. You better get ready to trim your lamp, right? And the wise are waking up 
and they're starting to hear and press in to what God's calling them to do, but the foolish, they're coming to that realization. Whoops, the door is shut. I missed it. Now, one way to understand this, I was meditating on this, and this is what I felt the Lord showed me. Think about a modern-day revival. Think about an awakening. Maybe you've had the privilege to be part of one, or, or you've heard of them, or what have you. But what happens in a revival? It's very interesting because many pray for revival. Many say they want revival. Many say, I can't wait until there is a revival. And when that, when that revival breaks out, boy, I'm going to be right there. I want to be a part of it. Amen. And I believe for the most part their heart is right. They have the right intention. But then when the revival comes, for whatever reason, they don't enter in. They don't participate. Why? Because they did not prepare their vessel. They did not prepare and put the proper oil in their vessel for the outpouring and the coming of God. Mm. Because maybe they thought, hmm, I'll just continue on just the way I'm going. I'll believe for it. Hallelujah. I believe it's going to come and I can't wait and I'll participate. But unless you prepare your vessel beforehand when it comes, you can't participate. You will miss it or even become a critic of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know that I know this. <laughs> God help us. We have to allow the Lord to stretch us, enlarge us. Oh, when revival comes, I'll be in the house of the Lord every night, and I'll be praying and seeking God and fasting, and I, I'll, I'll start repenting, and boy, it'll be, and God's saying, no, 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 you need personal revival. You need to prepare your personal vessel if you're going to be part of the move of God. You've got to be ready and prepare this vessel if you're going to be part of the midnight cry when the Lord returns. Now, what will the church look like when the midnight cry sounds? By the way, it's sounding. What's the church of wise virgins going to look like? I believe we're going to be a people, a church that live in repentance, that live in the confession of our sins, that are aware, come on, of the, the holiness of God, a people that live in the fear of the Lord. It's going to be a people that get back to the word, an uncompromised commitment to the word of God. The word is what it is. It says what it is. It needs nothing to be added to or nothing to be taken away. And I believe our preaching will become simple once again and just preach Christ and Christ crucified. I believe that the wise virgin midnight hour church is going to be a church so full of the power of the Holy Spirit, so baptized with his glory, so baptized in his power, that we go forth with a holy boldness, torches of fire, amen, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel, hallelujah. And I believe this will happen in the marketplace. And I believe with all of my heart, amen, that there's going to be a harvest, a harvest, a harvest that's beyond anything we ever dreamed or imagined. And young people, young people, young people will be right in the center. It's going to be the book of Acts on steroids. hundred times beyond what we saw in the book of Acts. Because it's the last harvest, the last great move of God. The midnight cry... Now listen, it's going to be a time of darkness and gross darkness that covers the earth. And it's going to be a sign to the believers and the non-believers. Mm, it's, it's wake up time, not just for the church. God's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Haggai, Hebrews. God's going to shake everything that can be shaken. There's going to be signs, metaphorically speaking. Whether it's literal darkness or spiritual darkness, there's going to be darkness. There's going to be fear that comes over people on the earth. At the same time, the church is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Huh? The world's getting darker and darker, as it says in Isaiah 60, even gross darkness, the two are together. Even the lost, even the world is going to sit back and say, oh my God, it's getting dark. What are we going to do? But typical of the world, in their humanistic folly, they'll continue to say, well, it's always been like this. 
that's history. History repeats itself. And yeah, it's getting bad, but someone, someone will figure it out, right? Someone will always figure it out. Man's in control. Mm hmm Not this time. It's going to get so dark that men will begin to get fearful. It's going to get so dark. Maybe there's going to be uh, natural calamities and uh, weather situations, uh, economic collapse, maybe a pandemic that's greater than what we just experienced, right? Maybe wars, maybe a limited nuclear war. But it's going to get dark. It may be a natural darkness, like Joel said. When the sun is darkened and the moon turns to blood, maybe there's something to do with the, the eclipse that's coming in a week or two. But somewhere, somehow, God's trying to get the attention of our nation, the church, and the world. And even so, when the world sees it's the midnight hour and all darkness coming upon them and many are without, without hope, the Bible says many will still shake their fist and curse God. Ooh, now, are you ready? Buckle your seatbelt. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. <coughs> Excuse me. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. The literal, physical return and coming of Jesus when he leaves his physical throne, okay, in heaven and comes to earth happens after this. Now stay with me. This is what happens. This is a spiritual picture of what happens when Jesus, upon his throne, orchestrates this wonderful, powerful move of God, this last day conflict when he oversees his, his people, his army, come on, come, defeat the powers of hell. First there must be the victory in the earth, then he comes, Psalm 110, and the Lord will remain sitting upon his throne until every enemy is made his footstool. Acts 3.19, heaven shall hold the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ until the restoration and fulfillment of all things. Behold, he will come, for he has made all things ready. We don't need to go through all that. We did that last week. The point is this. Before the Lord comes physically, amen, when all can see him, and he establishes his throne and judgment, his church his church is involved in the great final conflict, and we defeat the forces of hell. And then we welcome the king. Now, let me digress for a moment and just say this. I know everyone's shook a little bit. We shouldn't be. It's really, you know, it's so funny. If you haven't heard something other than this, you go, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> we deal with old concepts. The book of Revelation, dare I go here. The book of Revelation, the Bible says that its title is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So to understand the book of Revelation, we need to understand first and foremost, it's all about the appearing and the revelation of Jesus Christ. But more than this, we understand it to mean that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and his overcoming bride. Jesus, who was one with his bride, or his bride without spot or wrinkle, that has been made with one with him, and as part of this last day battle and victory. 90% of this book has been fulfilled.
That's where we get tripped up. It's the book of the victory of Jesus. It's the book of the kingdom of God going forth into the earth, destroying, come on, every enemy. It's the, it's the story of, of Daniel's rock rolling over the earth and the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our God. And it ends with the glorious, come on, coming of the Lord to a victorious church and ruling and reigning with him. It's only been the past 50 years that this book really has come to light. And that's why we need to be careful. I was looking at it the other day. I said, if anyone adds to this book, they're going to get every curse that's in this book. Did you read that part? Go, oh, my God. But it is a vision. It's a spiritual book. It's not about let's all understand and agree 100% with what I'm saying here. Not the point. The point is to be stretched and enlarged, challenged, provoked, to press in, to know God, prepare our vessels. But... Here's the key. The book of Revelation is a vision. John had a vision. And in order to interpret and understand a vision, you've got to use the spiritual keys. The Bible interprets itself. And when we're not properly prepared, when we're in our carnal mind, when we're influenced by a religious spirit, we will interpret the Bible through that natural religious understanding and filter. Hence, we have a hundred different versions and understanding of the book of Revelation. It's like a vision. You can only understand a vision spiritually. Are you all still with me? Peter was on the roof. And he saw a vision of this tablecloth coming down, tied in four corners with every manner of unclean animal. It was a vision. If he would have interpreted it wrong, he would have went out and got a hot dog. <laughs> he would have went and got himself, come on, some ribs. <laughs> he, <laughs> oh, he had to interpret it in the spirit. What God is saying is, this gospel is for Gentiles as well as we must be spiritual people if we're going to discern spiritual truth. So very, very, very important, right? Now, can I just challenge you? Have a little fun? And you know what's amazing about all this? If you're right or wrong, it's still going to happen, and it's perfect. <laughs> well, we say, okay, well, what about all the different scenes in heaven? Like, I just read one. What about all these scenes of people worshiping in heaven? Are these literal scenes, or is it a picture, a spiritual vision of how we're supposed to worship? He's trying to teach us. Wow, well, there's, there's harps, and there's bowls, and there's incense. We understand that in the spirit to mean worship, praise, intercession, right? And there's one who sits upon the throne and overcome or stand around the throne. That's a good little word for us. <clears throat> One is worthy to sit. The rest of us have to stand and worship. Oops. <clears throat> Unless you've got a condition. Well, what about, we've got 144,000 here. We've got 1,000 here. We've got 10,000 times 10,000 over here. What does all that mean? Not literal numbers. If it is, we're in trouble. If only 144,000 make it, we're in trouble. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses, with not understanding, say there's 144 of us make it, so you better go out and knock on doors. You've got to work for it. <laughs> it's, they're, they're not literal numbers. What about the New Jerusalem? What about Oz? What about the celestial city that's going to come out of the sky? the size of Rhode Island, and land on, on Jerusalem. Come on, it says it. Church, New Jerusalem's here. Yes. New Jerusalem is the church. It's the city of the living God. Yes. It's spiritual, lively stones being built up to a holy habitation. We are New Jerusalem. Yes. <clears throat> are you enjoying this? Yes. Now, don't you take away my pearly gates. And you better not even mess with Peter. Because we know Peter's there, right? What's your name again? <laughs> Sorry you're not on the list. Pearly Gates speak of the only way you can get entrance into this wonderful experience is through, come on, 
the pearls, suffering, affliction, and adversity, and things that make you into the image and likeness of God. Through much tribulation you enter. Ah, oh, what about the streets of gold? Don't take away my streets of gold. Well, they speak of a walk of holiness and purity among believers. Mm -mm -mm. Well, what about the river of life? There's got to be a river of life flowing out of this place. I don't know about you, but I got one flowing out of me. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. There's a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors and sets the captives free. There's a river of life flowing out of me, and I don't have to wait to get it. <laughs> the trees that bring healing. Are you not a tree of righteousness, Pat? I'm a tree of righteousness, and there's healing in my life to impart to others. I want to tell you, I believe all seven seals have been opened. All six trumps have blown, but one, the seventh trump, and it's about to sound, and it's the trump that declares the coming of the Lord and all his glory and splendor. Here's our problem. Believe in those things. Hold them. Look for them. Fine. But don't get caught up in a religious spirit that wants to take all the good stuff now and put it somewhere in the future. We want to fight about our mansions and our golden streets. And the Lord's saying, my God, I died to give it to you now. Amen. If that happens, wonderful. Oh, Lord. Isn't that funny how we are? We get so upset. Someone touch heaven. Someone touch my golden streets in my mansion. Man, I'm ready to fight. I'll leave the church for that. And the Holy Spirit's trying to say, if you really want to believe that, go for it. But can I tell you, he's got something real good for us right now. Religion always says God moved in the past and he's going to do something in the future. Not too much happening today. That's a spirit. That's a lying demon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, remember the actual Wedding ceremony is after the great banquet. There's the banquet in Jewish wedding tradition, and we see it here in, the Pro in, in Proverbs 20, I mean, Matthew 25. There is the banquet, the feast, and then the actual marriage ceremony, right? Now, this portion in, in Revelation 19 that we just read, it depicts spiritually the great final War on the earth and in the heavenlies, amen, and the clash of two kingdoms. Jesus in the midst of his church, orchestrating his great army in the great conflict. I found, I was laying in bed last night, couldn't sleep, nothing normal, nothing abnormal rather. And I thought of a book that I haven't thought of in years and years and years. Anyone remember the book by Rick Joyner, Final Conquest? Wow, it was one of the most influential books I've ever read. And I just felt to go get it. And I said, well, that's a, good sh that's a good shot. And I went right in. It was right there. I picked it up, and it started talking about Joyner's experience in vision, and he came upon a whole group of people that the Bible said were in the lower realms of heaven. And he said, well, who are you people? With all your glory, he said, oh, we're foolish virgins. We didn't really give ourselves to the call and purpose of God. Oh, we're thankful we're here. But every day we realize what we could have. Anyway, that's not the part I wanted to say. The part was the final conflict. And he talks about the final great war. And he just confirmed everything I'm preaching to you. I didn't go to him for reference. But he was talking about the great final war. When all the hell will come against God's people to separate them. Depression, discouragement, pride, accusing of the brethren, offense. And he, remember the story? These demonic beings hanging on people and just binding them up and keeping them from going forward. And he talked about the great final war and battle and the Lord orchestrating the battle. I would say, God, thank you. I don't need the confirmation, but it just spoke to faith and strength to me. We are living, church. We're living in such an hour, such an amazing time. Now, Jesus is not returning. Now, someone's going to say, wait a minute, we just read it. Jesus is not returning on a horse. 
what we saw was imagery. What we saw was a spiritual picture to help us understand the impact of how it's going to happen as the Lord comes in the midst of his people by his spirit and, and destroys the powers of hell, Jesus is going to return to the earth the same way he left. He's not coming on a horse. He didn't leave on a horse. Amen. He's coming in the clouds. Yeah. Right? Remember what the, the, Jesus said to his disciples at the, at the Mount Olivet? When he was going to, he ascended, he said, guys, listen, he said, you're going to see me, the Son of Man, returning in the same manner you see me leave. He left in the clouds, not on a horse. And it's not cirrus or cumulus. It's the Shekinah glory of God. <laughs> or it could be a cloud of witnesses. But do you see what I'm saying? Are you all with me? Look at Revelation 19, verse 7. We're bringing it together here. Look at Revelation. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. This is right before what we just read. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and her wife has made herself ready. Ah, this happens before the great, this happens during the great and final war, before, come on, before his return. What does it mean? The overcoming bride is victorious and overcome her enemies. Look at Revelation 19, 17. This will be our last scripture. Look at this. This is right after what we read about him coming. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat of the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. I believe, now here, that stretch, let's just be stretched a little bit, okay? I really believe that this is the marriage supper of the Lord. Oh, I just said it, I don't have to believe it. How do we apply it? I believe the marriage supper of, supper of the Lamb is a spiritual experience. And we think it was, well, we think it was like this huge table, as long as eyes can see, billions of people sitting at the table with the finest linen and golden utensils. And, of course, they will serve spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> well, how could they not? No. And you say, well, I've got the picture hanging in my dining room. How could it not be real? I don't know if it is real or not, but let's don't miss the real point of this. The real point of this is there's going to be a marriage feast. There's going to be a spiritual meal, an experience in God beyond anything the finest chefs, the culinary angels in heaven could conjure up and titillate our flesh and taste bud. <laughs> it's a spiritual meal to nourish our spirit man. It's a spiritual man to minister such strength, joy exceeding, come on, glory, the, 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 the joys of victory. It's going to be a spiritual meal for a spiritual man and a spiritual people. I believe we can partake, we will partake and taste of the flesh of our enemies. That's gross. But Jesus said, unless you eat, <laughs> unless you, come on, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part in me. He's not speaking literally. Of course he's not. He's not saying, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to be one with me. He's speaking spiritual truths. He's speaking spiritual. So in the same manner, we can come together and we can partake of the Lord's Supper with understanding. I'm being nourished and strengthened and blessed. I'm receiving of Him. There's an impartation to me. Even in the Lamb's Supper, we are understanding that it's spiritual. My God, we are partaking of Him in all His victories, in the victories of God. Our enemies are under our feet. We're being imparted to supernatural strength. Amen. Joy of knowing knowing we've overcome the enemy. Yeah, yeah. 
I was going to say, no pun intended, chew on it. <laughs> How joyous is that? How exciting is that? Why is this feast going to be so nourishing when we partake of the flesh of our enemies? How? Why? Because we come into the realization our enemy is defeated. That enemy that has brought sickness and death and, 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 and all the horrors that mankind has known all its, its existence. These horrible things on the earth that have plagued me and tormented me, they are now under my feet. They are defeated. The evil, the evil that put Jesus on the cross to die that horrible death it's been avenged. It's been defeated. Listen, it's always been our portion to bruise the head of the serpent. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath his feet. My God. This great ceremony, church, is going to be greater than all the celebrations the world has ever known put together. It'll pale in comparison to the joy, to the victory celebration that the enemies have been defeated. Come on. And the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. It's going to be a celebration the likes the world has never seen. Mm -mm -mm. It's the party of parties, church. Remember the book of Daniel? <laughs> oh, boy. Babylon's in for a shock. Babylon is in for a shock, church. The systems of this world, the religions of this world, the corrupt, ungodly people that have shook their fist and defied the living God, oh, they're having a party. Remember King Belshazzar, the king of Babylon? He said, we're going to have ourselves a party. And we're going to invite thousands of nobles, everyone who is somebody, every notable, famous, influential noble will come to this great banquet, the great banquet. And in the midst of this great glorious banquet, when all of Babylon is celebrating, hallelujah, he gets an idea, hey, break out the golden vessels, the ones we ripped off and stole from the holy place in Jerusalem. Go get the golden vessels. Let's fill them with our wine and let's get drunk, right? Come on. Suddenly in the midst of their big party and celebration, they didn't realize it, but their party was about to get crashed. Because all of a sudden, a, a man's hand shows up and his finger begins to scratch and inscribe in the plaster on the wall, eeny, meeny, peck meeny or something. <laughs> I never got that right. The party is over. The party is over, Babylon. And the king's knees began to buckle and shake. And he, and, he, and he bowed over like a dead man. God's message to Babylon. God's message to the world system and the corruption and the evil and all those that exalted themselves above the living God. The message is the party is over. There's another party that's going to break forth and it's the righteous of God that are going to rise up in celebration knowing that their enemies have been defeated and the kingdom of God has come. Woo! Thank you, Roberto. Now that we're talking about the old church, there was a day, if I preached like that, everyone got up and shouted and clapped their hands. Uh, I don't have it anymore. You don't have to get up and clap and shout your hands. Shout your hands. Clap your hands. I pray something has quickened in you. The marriage supper of the Lamb will not fill people's bellies, but it will fill their hearts and minds with the fullness and the reality of their victorious Savior and the destruction of all of their enemies. That'll feed you spiritually with joy unspeakable. And then, right? Parable, Jewish custom, first the feast, then the coming of the Lord. And then the, the Lord will stand and he'll say, Michael, get your, get your trumpet ready. Angels, grab your shout. It's time. The Father says it's time. 
and he's going to come out of he's going to come out of the eastern sky he probably will come right through the gates of Jerusalem hallelujah and all his glory and splendor and those that are dead will arise and join those that remain and will be caught up with him in all his splendor and glory and will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye and will have a resurrected body just like his stay tuned come next week we'll have a resurrected body just like his and we'll come back to the earth and rule and reign with him forever Amen. hallelujah and there will be a judgment seat where he will separate the wheat and the tear and give eternal rewards or eternal judgments. Mm -mm -mm. It's Palm Sunday. And someone said, yeah, well, what's that have to do with anything? <laughs> well, if I don't say something about Palm Sunday, you all say it wasn't a legitimate message. <laughs> it's simply this. On that Palm Sunday, Jesus rode in Jerusalem on a donkey. Micah said in humility on a donkey. Zachariah said, your king cometh. And he came in for a week of passion. He came in understanding he was going to the cross, a week of passion and all that was before him. Some of them praised and shouted and waved palms. Others criticized him, spoke against him. But can I tell you, he's coming a second time. He is coming. And I believe he's going to come and all eyes shall see him. And he's going to come and he will probably come to Jerusalem. I'm good with that. He's going to come in all his splendor and glory. And there's going to be a praise. There's going to be a sound of praise that's resounding. How is every eye on the earth going to see him? I don't know, but God can do it. Every eye is going to see him when he comes. And you know what I believe? I believe this time millions, millions of Jews are going to wave their palms and praise and shout, Our king cometh, because it will be the fulfillment of Apostle Paul in Romans 9 when he said, all Israel shall be saved. Does that mean every single one? No, it means in general, the nation shall be saved. As a matter of fact, I believe God's going to bless his seed, Ishmael, and I believe millions of Muslims are going to get saved. In the great harvest, millions of Muslims, Hindus. <laughs> oh, Lord. Buddhists. Because of the great harvest, the grace of God, the powerful outpouring of God, it's good. I'm trying to tell you it ends good. It all ends good. And we may be part of that in this day. I'm going to ask the praise and worship team to come. And we're going to partake of communion. I know it's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to chew on. We can discuss it. But we see through a glass darkly, don't we? But everything's getting brighter and brighter and brighter. You really want to come next week. We're just going to proclaim the simplicity of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, the coming of the Lord, and you and I getting glorified bodies, rolling and reigning. Doesn't that sound good? That's our blessed hope, church. But all that we're sharing, is not to bring conflict, confusion, contradiction. It's not about right and wrong. Please hear this. It's simply to stir us, stir us. If nothing more than you got stirred in your spirit to search these things out to see if they be so. It's not about conforming to someone's opinion. It's not. It's about you being stirred by the Holy Spirit for you to seek God for you to press in. And what really determines whether this has been successful is not if you've got greater revelation and you can explain something about the end times. No, it's that you've been provoked. You've been stirred. You've been stirred in your heart. I need more of God. You've been stirred to the urgency of the hour. Right? You, you say, I, I want more of his love. I need more of his grace. I want to be a part of this and not miss it. I want to join John at the end of the book when he says, even come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I want to be ready. That's what this does for me. I'm not all right. Don't hold me to that. 
I'm trying my best. I'd never preach anything I didn't have a conviction on. But the Lord showed me, you don't have to convince anyone of anything. Just throw it out. And I pray you grab it and say, I'm more hungry for God than ever before.